Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth, where in these episodes we've been discussing some of the amazing scientific miracles of the Quran. Information in a book 1,400 years old that every Muslim believes is the uncreated word of Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, revealed for the benefit and the guidance of all of humanity. But it's not just a claim that we make, it's something that we can back up with evidence. And we believe that for any rational human being, any thinking person who takes the time and takes the energy and takes the effort to look at these evidences and examine them dispassionately, will come to know that truly Islam is what it claims to be, the religion that has been revealed by God the Creator for the guidance and the benefit of all of mankind. And in our last episode, we were talking about some amazing facts in the Qur'an concerning the universe, how the Qur'an had described the universe is expanding, that the universe has a common origin, and that the universe that we know it as today was formed out of a gaseous mass, and how all of this information was only discovered recently. Let's look at some more verses of the Qur'an concerning cosmology. One of the verses we want to mention is that Allah is the one who created the night and the day, the sun and moon. Each one is traveling in an orbit with its own motion. Now it's interesting that the Arabic word referring to movement with self-propelled motion is the verb sabaha. And yes, babuna is what the actual text mentions. Now, this implies a motion that comes from the body in question itself. So if it takes place in water, it means to swim. If it means on land, it means to walk. So the implication is the movement is coming from the body itself. So if it was talking about something in space, it would mean to rotate. It would itself rotate. Now, this is amazing. The Qur'an is talking 1,400 years ago about the earth and the moon and the sun rotating. If you are perhaps thinking that the sun is static, it's not. The sun, as does the earth, as does the moon, they all rotate. Of course, the earth, however, rotates around the sun. The sun rotates around its own axis. So, it is actually quite correct is saying and of course the earth is in orbit around the sun and also by the way the sun is also in orbit but it is in orbit around the center of the galaxy in fact it is believed that ultimately if the sun keeps going in its orbit it would ultimately end in what is known as the solar apex a sort of position that it will end up in the center of the galaxy so what we find here is that the Qur'an is talking about things that no one could really know this information 1,400 years ago. It is scientifically accurate. The idea of the alternation of the night and the day and of the spherical nature of the earth is actually implied in the 31st surah and the 29th ayah of the Qur'an. Have you not seen how Allah merges the night into the day and the day into the night? And in another verse, the 39th chapter in the fifth ayah or the fifth verse, the Quran mentioned, he coils the night upon the day and he coils the day upon the night. And this word that is used in the Quran in the original Arabic is kawarra. Kawarra, in its original meaning, means the action of coiling a turban around your head. Coiling a turban. So it describes kawarra, how the night and the day coils one round the other. And you can find that description of the interpenetration of one sector by another is expressed in the Quran just as if the concept of the earth's roundness had already been conceived at the time. 
which is, except for a few, there were a few philosophers who had theorized that the earth was round, but it was not really a generally accepted idea. But it is something that is implied in the Quran, and certainly we can gather this today from our present day knowledge. It's a very another interesting aspect that in one place in the Quran, the word that is used to describe the shape of the earth is the same word that is used to describe the egg of the ostrich. Now, looking at this globe, for example, you may imagine that the earth is completely spherical. But in reality, that is not the case. The earth is slightly misshaped. It is not a perfect sphere. And in fact, slightly elongated, rather like an ostrich egg. So it is incredible also that the Quran is describing that shape of the earth. At least this is a possible interpretation of those verses. Certainly we can say that none of these things actually contradict present modern scientific knowledge. In fact, if you think about it, if we were only to bring a book 1,400 years old and you were to find absolutely no contradictions, and I don't mean here to say that the Quran affirms anything. Let's say it doesn't affirm any scientific knowledge. Let's say it didn't even preempt any scientific knowledge. Let's say there was nothing special in the Quran, which of course is not the case because I've spent a couple of episodes showing you exactly how amazing the Quran is when it talks about aspects of the universe and the world in which we live. But let's just say those things were not there. Let's just say there was nothing that contradicted present day knowledge. That itself alone would be remarkable. Because the superstitions and the beliefs that people had 1,400 years ago were remarkable. For example, the ancient Greeks believed that the Milky Way, the Milky Way is the band of stars that you can see in the sky. In fact, it constitutes our galaxy. They believed that the Milky Way was produced when a particular Greek goddess was breastfeeding her child and the child bit her breast and her milk spilled out and that's how the Milky Way got to be in the universe. That's their legend of how the Milky Way came to be there. Of course, today we probably all had a good laugh at that and how totally ridiculous it is. How come the Quran does not have any stories like that? How come the Quran does not have any fantastical descriptions of the origin of the universe and the earth? We find it doesn't. We find that what it says can be perfectly easily and sensibly reconciled with modern scientific knowledge. No. Indeed, many of the verses preempt what scientists have discovered today. Don't go away. We've got more for you in the next part of the proof that Islam is the truth after the break. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth, where we're talking about some of the amazing scientific facts in the Quran that have been only discovered recently with modern scientific knowledge. Yet these things were mentioned in a book 1,400 years old. Let's look at some more of the amazing statements in the Quran. In the 10th surah, in the 5th ayah, the 5th verse, it says, It is He, meaning God, Allah, who made the sun a shining lamp, and the moon as a light, and measured out their stages. Now the Quran describes the sun as siraj. Now the word siraj means torch, means it's something that generates its own heat and light. Whereas this, the moon is described as a nur. Now a nur means a light that is originating from another source. And of course this is the correct understanding the moon reflects the light of the sun. It's common knowledge today, but not necessarily so in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Let's see what one of the respected cosmologists 
and scientists in the field of astronomy had to say when he was shown some of the statements in the Quran concerning his field of expertise. Professor Yushidi Kusan, who's the director of the Tokyo Observatory in Tokyo in Japan, and this is what he said, I say I am very much impressed by finding true astronomical facts in the Quran. And for us modern astronomers who have been studying a very small piece of the universe, we have concentrated our efforts for understanding that very small part. Because by using telescopes, we can only see a very few parts of the sky without thinking about the whole universe. So by reading the Quran and by answering to questions, I think I can find my future way for investigating the universe. What he's saying is that the one who is writing the Quran, the one who is revealing the Quran, the one who is speaking the words of the Quran, is talking as if he is looking at the whole universe together as opposed to the scientist who concentrates on observing this bit or that bit of the universe, which is what most astronomers do. Who is it that sees the whole universe altogether? Who is it who sees all things in all places in all times, except Allah, the mighty, the wise? So these are some of the amazing scientific facts. And we're going to move on also to another area that particularly interested me because when I was at school, one of the subjects that I studied was geography. And a sub-subject of that was, of course, geology. And I do remember when I first read the Qur'an 20 years ago, and it was reading the Qur'an that motivated me to embrace Islam. One of the things that stuck in my head, and I remember it until today, was coming across the descriptions in the Qur'an of mountains. So let's go through some of the things the Quran says about mountains. For example, in the 78th surah in verses 6 to 7, Allah says, Have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains stakes? The word that is used here is otad. Otad meaning stake is like the, the peg of the tent. So the peg of the tent goes into the ground. It holds the rope that holds the tent. So you have a small part of the peg sticking up from the ground, but the majority of the peg is inside the ground. The Quran also says in the 31st surah, or the 31st chapter in the 10th verse, and Allah has cast into the mountains, standing firm, so that it does not shake with you. Now today, with modern sonar technology, they have been able to bounce sound waves down through the Earth's crust. And according to the different rates at which the sound waves are reflected back and are measured, they can tell the different density of the Earth's crust as opposed to what is hard and what is soft, what is from the crust and what is from the magna. And what they have discovered with this technology is exactly what the Qur'an was saying 1,400 years ago. That the mountains have roots. The mountains, like the peg of the tent, not only do they go, go above the earth's surface, the mountains go deeply into the earth's core. And they act, it has been theorized, as stabilizers. They help to stabilize the earth's surface. And there's two ways in which they do that. Number one, because the earth is composed of tectonic plates. The crust of the earth is actually made of different plates. And it is the movement of these plates that causes earthquakes. When these plates move against each other, the friction of that movement causes earthquakes. And that's also what they think how continental drift has happened. Originally, they believe all the continents were one continent. And then because of plate tectonics, it moved. But the Qur'an is saying is the mountains act as stabilizers. They help to stabilize the earth's crust. And this is something that has actually been theorized by modern geologists. There's another way in which the mountains may act as a stabilizing factor. 
And that is to do with the rotation. Maybe if you try and spin something, you will find that if it is not really spherical, it will, not, it will start to ro rotate and then it will start to wobble out of shape. And it is possible that the mountains actually act as a counterbalance to keep the Earth's rotation smooth. I do stress, of course, that these are theories, but it is very interesting what the Qur'an is saying 1,400 years ago, and that it seems to be preempting the ideas and the knowledge that is being produced by modern-day science. Certainly, it is a fact that is established that the mountains have roots, and the Qur'an is saying that the mountains are like, or turd, the pegs of a tent. So this is a remarkable scientific fact. It's one I remember sticking in my mind when I first read the Qur'an about 20 years ago. So these are one of the remarkable things. Also, the Qur'an mentions some aspects of animal and plant life. For example, the 16th chapter of the Qur'an is called Surah Al-Nahl, which means the Surah of the Bee. And one of the aspects of the Qur'an in this Surah, it is talking about the bee. And it's very interesting that the word that is used in the Qur'an for the bee that flies around gathering honey or gathering the nectar for the honey, it is used in the female form. The gender that it is used is feminine. Although until recently it was believed that the bees were actually soldiers, they were males, and the ruler of the hive was a king. But as it happens, in fact, we know that the bees are indeed female and they are owned or they are headed by a queen. That's why we say the queen bee. It's also true that the Quran mentions that plants have different genders and the winds are a means of fertilization for the plants. So in the 15th chapter of the Quran, in the 22nd verse, it says, that we, meaning Allah, the Creator, this is the we of nobility. Does not mean there is more than one God, of course. It is we in the sense that royalty uses the term we. It's a sense of honor and nobility. So the royal we, they call it. We sent forth the winds that fessontate. That means that the fertilized things. These are all recently discovered things. Also, we find the Greek philosopher Democritus, who lived from 460 to 361 BC, he advanced the theory that matter was composed of tiny indivisible particles called atoms. And they believed that this was the base upon which all of things were made. And there was nothing smaller than the atom. However, modern science has discovered that atom is in fact divisible. And the atom has been split and the atom itself is composed of smaller elements. The Qur'an says 1,400 years ago in the 34th chapter and the third ayah or the third verse, he is aware of an atom's weight in the heavens and on the earth and even anything smaller than that. Meaning there is something smaller than an atom and Allah, God, is aware of it. Every single thing. There's another thing I want to mention. God mentions in the Quran some amazing things about the human beings. And one of the things is about our nerves. Here is a very frightening and terrifying passage of the Quran. It's mentioned in the 75th chapter in Ayahs 3 to 4. Does mankind think that we cannot assemble his bones? Nay, we are able to put together in perfect order the very tips of his fingers. God is telling us he can recreate us on this day, this terrifying day, this frightening day, the day of judgment. He is able to recreate you, even if you are dust, even you are bones to the very tip of your finger. Why the very tip of your finger? Of course, you've all heard of fingerprinting, haven't you? Every single human being's fingerprint is unique. Why did God mention the fingerprint? Why did God mention the tip of the finger? This is the uniqueness of the human being. God is telling us, look, I can recreate you even to this fingertip. That is the power that I have. Even to your most unique attribute, I can create you to that. Be mindful. Be careful. I will create you again on the day of judgment. 
and I will judge you and ask you about every single thing that you have done. This is not common knowledge. How did anyone 1,400 years ago know about fingerprinting? And Allah warns us in the fourth chapter of the Quran in the 56th verse, those who reject our signs, we shall soon cast them into the hellfire. And as often as their skins are roasted through, we shall change them for fresh skins so they may truly taste the penalty. For Allah is exalted in power of the wise. This is a very frightening description of the hellfire. God is going to burn the skin and recreate the skin and burn the skin. So the people in the hellfire will taste the punishment. Why is the Quran saying that? It has only recently been known and discovered that when the skin is burnt, a person does not feel any pain. That's why when a person suffers severe burns, a doctor will prick the skin to see if the person feels pain. If he feels pain, there are still nerve receptors left. If he does not, that means his skin has been so badly burnt, he cannot feel pain. So if God put people in the hellfire, and the hell burnt their skins, after that they will not feel the pain. So Allah is going to recreate the skin again, so they will keep on tasting the punishment. It is a very severe warning from the one who has created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he is warning you in his book of his knowledge and his ability that if you do not believe in him and follow his guidance, see what is waiting for those people who reject the faith. My dear listeners, we have only one more thing we want to mention. The tree of Zaku, which will be the food of sinners. And it will be like boiling oil that will boil in their bellies, like the boiling of scalding water. Taste this, Allah says in the Quran. Verily, you are pretending to be the mighty, the generous. Look at those arrogant people pretending to be mighty, pretending to be generous. But taste the Z tree of Zakum that will boil in your belly. And it says they will drink a water that cuts their bowels to pieces. It is very interesting that thermal receptors are not present in the intestines, but it is in the bowels. And the contents and the receptors in the bowels are highly sensitive. It's a very, very sensitive area, and that is where pain is initiated. It's not a common knowledge 1,400 years ago, but it is a fact that is mentioned in the Quran as a stark warning to all those people who reject faith in God. God has combined the scientific facts with the severe warnings of those who disbelieve in him. Our invitation is to invite you to his mercy, to his guidance and his forgiveness by accepting these truths, the proof that Islam is the truth. Join us in the next episode for some amazing prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. And until then, may God's peace and blessings and guidance be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.